Well, as Bill would say, it's about that time. So I want to welcome you all to our September edition of Bites and Bits of History. Now, before we get into that, just a couple of introductory pieces. If you missed our Good Humor virtual walking tour, you can still check that out on our YouTube site or our Facebook page. So make sure you check that out. It's a great compliment to the program you're going to hear today. And I also want to let you know that we are partnering with our friends at Oh Wow for their 10th annual Silly Science Sunday. Now there's still time to get some of those STEM sacks, so go ahead and visit ohwowkids.org, which is their website, and you'll be able to participate in this year's event. So to get to our main event today, I want to introduce our executive director, Bill Lawson. Now, Bill has worked with the Mahoning Valley Historical Society for 33 years, and he's been our executive director since 1991. He is a lifelong Mahoning Valley native and received his primary and secondary education in the Boardman local school system. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree and his Master's of Arts degree in history from YSU. He has researched, written, and lectured extensively on the history of the Mahoning Valley. I'm sure you've seen him before. And he's a former board member of the Ohio Museums Association and a past board member and president of the Ohio Local History Alliance. He's a 15-year member and past president of the Rotary Club of Youngstown, the area's first service club, and a board member of Youngstown Cityscape, a development organization focusing on improvements in the central city. So without any further ado, here's Bill. Well, thank you, Tracy, and thank you for watching this anniversary special program. I'm going to highlight the founding and development of the Mahoning Valley Historical Society over the past 145 years. And I'm going to talk about the innovations and achievements of one of the Valley's most notable entrepreneurs and his most famous product from 100 years ago. And I'll conclude with a look at how the two stories come together in a historic landmark in downtown Youngstown. Mahoning Valley Historical Society was founded September 10th, 1875, with 400 charter members. It was at the second pioneer reunion of Mahoning and Trumbull counties, held in downtown Youngstown at the old Opera House on Central Square, that we had the first founding meeting of Mahoning Valley Historical Society. The new organization began with a very specific purpose, and I quote, to collect and preserve in proper form the facts constituting the full history of the Mahoning Valley. Also to obtain and preserve an authentic and general statement of its resources and productions of all kind. The first initiative of the new historical society was to publish a book called Historical Collections of the Mahoning Valley in 1876. This book included a record of the first two pioneer reunions, firsthand accounts from some of the pioneer citizens that were still surviving at that point, and histories of the cities and townships in the Mahoning Valley. After years of coming and going with, with programs and meetings, uh, the Historical Society was finally incorporated in the state of Ohio on February 8th, 1909. For more than a century now, Mahoning Valley Historical Society has been growing and developing in its programs and its uh, significance of its collections. And sometimes these patterns of growth have had quantum leaps. The first one occurred very early in 1910 when the board of the new Reuben McMillan Free Library offered a room and support from their staff for the Historical Society's collections and programs. Fifty years later in 1960, all of F.A. Arms, a longtime native and resident and philanthropist here in the Youngstown area, passed away and left most of her estate to the Historical Society including her home at 648 Wick Avenue in Youngstown. And the intention of that gift was to make her home into a new public museum. The Historical Society took possession 
of her property in March of 1961. And after a few years of fundraising and renovating the house to be a museum, it opened to the public for the first time in February 1964. In 1984, Mahoning Valley Historical Society renovated the carriage house behind the Arms Family Museum and opened it in 1984 as an archival library to house that collection and make it available in quality space for the public and to ensure its long-term preservation. In 2014, the Historical Society opened a new facet of its programs and mission with the Tyler History Center in downtown Youngstown. But we'll get to that story a little bit later. Now, the other story I want to bring into this is of our local entrepreneur named Harry B. Burt. Harry Burt was born August 9, 1874, in Trumbull County. His earliest life was not easy, as his parents separated uh, when he was a young child, and for a while he lived in between various relatives in Trumbull County. At the age of seven, Harry moved to Akron, and then later to Cleveland with his mother. And there, after some education, he went to work. As a young teenager, he worked as a boot black, shining shoes on street corners in Cleveland, and impressing people with the quality of his work. He next moved into sales jobs, and he was very successful in sales because he was highly organized and covered his territory well on a regular basis. Moving from there, in 1893, we know that Harry Burt went to Chicago for the World's Columbian Exhibition, and uh, there he worked as a taffy puller in one of the stands in the exhibition buildings. And uh, that is what inspired him to take up the candy making and selling business. After he finished at that Chicago World Fair in 1893, he came back to the Mahoning Valley and Youngstown with his mother. And at the age of 18, he opened his first downtown candy store on South Hazel Street, selling mostly penny goods. After being at that location for a short time and another one nearby in 1897, Burtz moved to 27 North Phelps Street. And there he developed new products, including ice cream, and sold them from the same location, always stressing the highest quality of materials in his candies and ice creams. In 1902, Burtz expanded on North Phelps Street with a new building at 29, right next door to 27, and opened the first Arbor Garden dining room. The products continued to be of a high quality. He had brand new manufacturing facilities at 29 North Phelps Street. And the signatures really were quality, cleanliness, organization of public spaces, very meticulous in the way that Bert presented his store and his products to the public. Now, he was very purposeful in the way he went about his business and he always told us, or told people of his own time, why he did what he did. And I, I have a quote from Harry Burt here. He says, I have touched upon the evolution of this business to emphasize that the present rather elaborate establishment has been made possible through the liberal appreciation of Youngstown people for the quality I have maintained from the very beginning. If anyone can show us how we can do better anything we are now doing, their ideas will be most welcome, for we do know that this society appreciates the best in services and the very highest in quality. Now, looking at the way Bert went about his business, it can be best explained in modern terms of what you might call engagement marketing or experiential marketing. So every part of Bert's operations emphasized and included his customers, his clientele. And he wanted his customers and clientele to give him constant feedback about 
the business, uh, the experience in his dining areas and stores, and what he might do in the future, and also to try to make it personal for his customers so that they can tell other people about the great experiences they had at Burt's stores. Burt's operated in, into the 20th century, uh, continuing to expand his line of products and uh, to grow a local clientele. He even went and expanded into Warren. Uh, but something happened right at the beginning of the second decade, or the third decade of the 20th century, and that was 100 years ago. Harry Burt created, through trial and error, a new ice cream product. And to explain that, I have an excerpt here from a 1949 local radio program to tell you all how it happened. On August 19, 1949, a special radio program just for you, presented by the GM McKelvey Company, told this story to its listeners. Success stories are always fascinating, as well as inspiring. The August 20 Saturday Evening Post carries a modern success story which is interesting enough of itself, but is particularly interesting to folks here in Youngstown, because it is the story of a Youngstown family. Back in 1920, old-timers will remember Harry Burt Sr. was known as the quality ice cream candy and baking man of Youngstown, and his ice cream parlor on North Phelps Street was one of the most popular spots in town. Mr. Burt Sr. had invented a candy lollipop called a Good Humor Sucker, so named because of the then widely held belief that the humor of the mind was regulated by the humors of the palate. On a particular January night in the year 1920, Mr. Burt was assisted by his 21-year-old son Harry Jr., his 23-year-old daughter Ruth, sat at the cash register, and to her he described between customers a novelty ice cream with which he was experimenting. Mr. Burt's experiments dealt with an especially smooth chocolate coating he had perfected to cover a small block of vanilla ice cream. He sent Harry Jr. to bring a sample from the cellar. Ruth pronounced it delicious. But, she added, wiping chocolate off her fingers, it's too messy to handle. Harry Jr.'s eyes fell on the boxes of lollipops. He said, let's put handles on them, the way we do on candy suckers. Burt said, I think we've got something. And thus was born the idea which has developed into a nationwide business, known as the Good Humor Corporation. Many of you listening right now will remember those familiar white trucks which used to dispense good humors back in the early 20s. That's all the time we have for today. We'll be back Monday long about coffee time. Until then, here's our little thought for the day. We must always have old memories and young hopes. Now you can see in that story what all goes into making a new product and really revolutionizing a certain industry, uh, which Harry Burt very much did uh, with the invention of Good Humor brand of ice cream. Now, it's important to note at this point that the whole Good Humor story, the Good Humor brand, and the method by which it was manufactured and marketed and distributed started here in Youngstown, Ohio with Harry Burt and his son and daughter and continued to grow throughout the 1920s. Even the brand name, Good Humor, refers to one's visible health and disposition. So to say somebody looks good or is enjoying themselves, they are in a good humor. And I think that was an important reflection on Harry Burt's marketing skill, but also how much he thought about his customers and how they enjoyed their products. He also went to expand sales of Good Humor ice cream products from beyond the retail store setting. And so in the 1920s, early on, he had people, usually boys, uh, teenagers, selling good humor in, in boxes packed with dry ice uh, on the street or tricycles with a freezer box on the front going through the streets in downtown. And he also bought a fleet of a dozen Chevrolet vehicles with a special cab and freezer unit on the back and with a white uniform sales associate driving through local neighborhoods ringing a bell created a whole new phenomenon for door-to-door -door sales and something we still enjoy today. 
in terms of the ice cream trucks going through our neighborhood. Eventually, uh, Burt incorporated the Good Humor brand into a new company and began offering franchises for making and selling ice cream suckers and other treats in other parts of the country. One of his first franchisees was his son, Harry Burt Jr., who took his franchise and opened up in Miami, Florida, and later opened another location in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But word was spreading. Along with building the Good Humor brand, Harry Burt did something else very significant in the early 1920s. And that happened in April 1922 when he opened a brand new store, retail sales, restaurant, and manufacturing facility at 325 West Federal Street. Now, this new store contained uh, many familiar names that were part of the Burt brand and experience. Uh, the Arbor Garden Room, uh, the dining area, was brought over to this new facility. The Wisteria Tea Cottage, which was a separate private room that could be used for uh, small events. Of course, a soda fountain and the famous candy and ice cream counters, as he called them. There were also some new features in this building, including a baked goods counter on the first floor, a cut flower shop, a dining room called the Peacock Dining Room on the second floor, and a 3,300 square foot room, the Rainbow Assembly Room. These were new features and uh, they encouraged visitors not only to come to buy products or to have lunch, but also to schedule, to schedule special events here at Burt's. Um, a lot of banquets happened here, a lot of dances, uh, school dances. Burt's even had a regular six night a week dance program if the schedule allowed where anybody could come in, get a dance card, have some refreshments and spend two hours on the floor of the Rainbow Assembly Room. Also at this location, visitors were encouraged to visit the candy factory on the third floor and the ice cream factory in the basement to see firsthand the quality, cleanliness, and care that went into Burt's products. As such, the Burt's experience continued to be very memorable for many local people of, of all ages. Unfortunately, Harry Burt's dreams were cut short. Um, he died on May 8th, 1926, of heart failure while at Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. In the aftermath, Burt's widow, Cora, went public with the Good Humor Ice Cream Company of America later in 1926. And then in 1928, Mrs. Burt sold the Good Humor brand and assets to a group of investors who formed the Good Humor Corporation of America, and national expansion continued as it would throughout the early to mid 20th century. In 1929, Burt's daughter and son-in-law, Ruth and Paul Bolton, purchased the candy and retail businesses and the locations at 325 West Federal Street and also on North Phelps Street here in downtown and at the same time dedicated the building at 325 West Federal Street for manufacturing, closing all the public facilities within. The Boltons continued to operate Burt's Candies through 1934, and then at that point they went out of business, and in 1935, the 325 West Federal Street location, the Burt Building, was sold. Now, very quickly we can move from 1935 until 2007. Uh, the Ross Radio Company bought out the building and moved in here at 325 West Federal Street in 1935. It was a wholesale radio, television, and electronics business and uh, did very well at this location and became a favorite stop for people either commercially or with their own private interests in radio and television and, and video to come and buy products. In 2006, the Burt Building and the Good Humor Story were one of 11 historic sites chosen by Parade Magazine 
to be most important in shaping American history and culture. Uh, this again was a national recognition of the good humor and Harry Burt story uh, for the first time in many years. In September 2007, Mahoning Valley Historical Society bought the building at 325 West Federal Street from the owners of Ross Radio Company. Ross Radio continued to operate here until May of 2008. Though well-worn after 85 years of continuous use, a remarkable amount of Burt's original interior features remained. Many were preserved in the designs for the new history center at this location between 2008 and 2010. And then between 2010 and 2017, Mahoning Valley Historical Society invested more than four and a half million dollars in preserving, renovating, and adapting the Burt Building. There was a soft opening of the new facilities here in what was dedicated the Tyler Mahoning Valley History Center in November 2014, and then a grand opening of the facility, the Tyler History Center, in November 2017. The Tyler History Center is truly a community center welcoming thousands of people through its doors every year for research, exhibits, educational programs, and special historical society, family, and corporate events. So that's a brief look at how those two stories and two local institutions, one business, uh, one educational, came together at 325 West Federal Street. Mahoning Valley Historical Society looks forward to a long future. Um, our current mission statement is that the Historical Society collects, preserves, and teaches the history of the people of the Mahoning Valley. That's pretty close to what it was in 1875 when we were founded. Everyone at the Mahoning Valley Historical Society appreciates the support of our community in carrying out our mission and that the community has taken our facilities, both here at Tyler Mahoning Valley History Center, but also Arms Family Museum to heart as important institutions in our region. And we're happy to preserve our region's history and tell the stories of the people of the Mahoning Valley, especially to preserve the century-old good humor story in our collections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, for that great program. So I hope you guys can join us next month. We've got a little combo pack. It's gonna be all about Oak Hill Cemetery and the history of cemetery architecture. So join us not only for Bites and Bits, but for a virtual Oak Hill Cemetery walking tour in October. <laughs>